And I, we ask you to be with us this morning, Lord. Uh, give us hearts that are obedient to the things we hear as we would walk out of here this morning, Lord. And I pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was thinking about, as we look at this title, Emmanuel, God with us. Basically, that's just what Emmanuel means, is that word is God with us. If you was con- to condense Christmas down into three words, I think those would be the three best words uh, that we could come up with. God with us. Um, and so I was thinking, and I think, Mike, actually, you shared something with the men's group of the mathematical equation. I've been thinking about this. I don't know if anybody, um, for you guys that were with Mike last Sunday, he shared a little bit of, of this uh, story. I wanted to share the story because I was thinking about the same story that Mike was sharing with you guys last uh, Sunday in the men's group. Um, there's this pretty famous, popular, whatever you call it, uh, mathematician that did, the, did a probability on Jesus Christ. Basically, what he did was, and if you guys know, there's over 300 um, prophecies in the Old Testament that predicts Christ, different aspects of who he is, his ministry, how he was born, how he's going to die, and how he's going to raise, be raised from the dead. So there was um, a probability, the probability is this guy, he only does eight. He doesn't do all 300, but he just does eight prophecies. And, and this brilliant mathematician came up with a number that was so, do you remember what the number was, Mike? It was 10th uh, to the 17th power. 10th to the 17th, who, who here is math, math, good at math? 10th to the, I think John, I think you're, isn't that 10th to the 17th power? What's that? Yeah. Then add, add some zeros. I know that whatever this guy, whatever this was, this guy did, this mathematician, um, he, he explains it like this. He said, it would be like taking half dollars and filling the state of Texas up to mid-shin with half dollars, and one half dollar was painted red, and it was thrown in the midst of that and mixed up. He said the probability of Jesus not, not fulfilling 300, but just fulfilling eight prophecies would be as if you would go into the state, bend down, pick up that red um, half dollar on the very first try. Why, do you, why is that important information as we consider some of the prophecies of the Old Testament for us today? What does it do for us? So basically what Mike said was it gives us confidence. That's the very thing that I was thinking about. You know, the fact that Jesus um, is, you know, who he says he was and who he is, it gives us confidence in knowing that we trust and believe in a risen Savior. So I want to look at this morning, like I said, this uh, Christmas message is going to be condensed into these three words, God with us, a very popular um, information that uh, gives us, that's given to us in the Bible. So in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14... The prophet Isaiah says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And so about 700 years before um, that was being fulfilled, Isaiah the prophet, as the Lord was speaking through him, was going to give, he gave one of those prophecies that, that I was talking about, about that. And it comes to be fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, at the beginning of the Christmas story there. It says, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with a child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, that's is where we get it, is God with us. Why is that important to understand God with us? What, is it, what does that say to you? What is it, how does it speak to you? I think that's actually really good what Trey said, is that we have a God that wants to be part of our lives. That's, what, that's the difference between, if you look at what Christianity is versus some other religions out here, we have a God that he, he moved first, he acted first in the saving of, uh, of people. And we see in this prophecy that's being fulfilled uh, that, uh, that Jesus is one of his names 
um, that he's going to be called is Emmanuel, which just simply means God with us. And so as I was thinking about Isaiah 7 and Matthew chapter 1, these two sections of verses, I came up with five things that we're going to look at this morning, or five truths that are, that's, about, that's about Jesus, and some things that's important for us to understand this time of the year. The first one that I want to look at is called, G, I just titled it, Jesus, Our Righteousness. Jesus, Our Righteousness. There's a, a thing in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6 that says this, In his days Judah will be saved. That's the southern kingdom, of, southern kingdom there in Israel. And Israel will also dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he is, will be called the Lord, Our Righteousness. What is righteousness? How would you define righteousness? Pure. What's that? Pure. pure. Is that what you said? Pure. Yeah, pure. We live. Matter of fact, it's in First John chapter three uh, that we're to purify ourselves just as Jesus is pure. What are some other ways, uh, other things you think of when you think of the word righteous or righteousness? Sinless. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, always doing the right thing. Why do you think it's important that we see here in Jeremiah that God is our righteousness? That's one of his names. So, so what Liz says, we can't be righteous. Who would agree? Who would agree with that? We all, we, none of us are righteous in of ourselves. We don't have anything. That's why it's so important for us, as we consider Jeremiah 23, 6, to understand that God is our righteousness. And when we come into a right relationship, we're going to get into that a little bit um, in this next section of verse, or, or this next verse, is that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Who's ever heard, it, uh, or heard of uh, imputed righteousness? Have you ever heard that term, imputed righteousness? It's a very popular, very somewhat uh, famous uh, way of looking at righteousness, imputed righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul says this. He says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So in that verse we see a, a term called imputed righteousness. And what it simply is, is it's Jesus' righteousness being imputed to us or to given to us and then our sins, the things that we have committed against God, are given then to Christ, and then he bears them on the tree at the cross uh, to die for our sins. And so in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we see that uh, being played out as uh, Paul, actually he finishes a pretty popular or pretty famous um, section in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That's the section that we're told that we're to be ambassadors. So what Mike said is that um, somebody had to die. So, I mean, you consider, um, if you consider, especially the Romans road, when you look at those different uh, verses that are in the book of Romans, where it says, Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then in Romans 6.23 it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus uh, our Lord. So we look at what Mike was talking about just then. Um, is that Jesus was the perfect sacrifice because he was without sin, that he had to be that way. And so that's what 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 uh, is talking about, is that, is that he gives us his righteousness when we come to faith in Christ, and he takes on our sin, uh, dies, because somebody has to die for sin. So it's going to either be us or it's going to be Christ. There's, no, there's nothing outside of that right there. So if you're going to do, matter of fact, there's a, actually it's a pretty sobering verse in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 5, where it says that if our sin, if our, or if our lives, our righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, we can't go to heaven. What kind of righteousness would that be? Matthew five, I think, is in the Sermon on the Mount. Talks Jesus says that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes, they're the teachers of the law, and the Pharisees, you will not enter heaven. What kind of righteousness do you think that looks like? And who can accomplish that? What's that? Even like what Mike said, even the Pharisees couldn't couldn't do that. The righteousness. Matter of fact, there's a there's one also. I think it's in I think it's Matthew. I think it's the, maybe it's the end of Matthew five. It might be the last verse. 
But Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. So there's a call for perfection. So since that stuff's in the Bible, what's that, what does that mean? What do you think Jesus is trying to do? That our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the religious leaders. And then he says to be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. What's that? So actually, Mike said, I like what he said. He said, we get to the end of ourselves. Because the, the standard by which we get into heaven is perfection. It's 100% perfection. That we do the law all the time in thought, in action, um, in deed, whatever, the, whatever uh, that we're doing. is We have to keep that law that way. And we know that we can. So that's why it says there in 2 Corinthians 5.21 that Christ is our righteousness. There's a place also in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 30 and 31, it says this, but, have, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So if we boast about anything, we're simply going to boast in what Jesus has done for us. What's, there's, there's three words in there that are pretty important words uh, that we need to understand. The first one which we're talking about is these five truths about who Christ is that Jesus is our righteousness. He also adds the word sanctification and redemption. What is sanctification? What's that? Be set apart? Be what's that? that actually, that, that's, a, that's one of the ones, too, that I think is pretty uh, popular definition, is to be holy. Matter of fact, in John chapter 17, and verse 17, when Jesus was praying uh, that last prayer before he was arrested, he's there in that prayer, it's actually easy to remember. It's just John 17, 17, chapter 17, verse 17. He says, um, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is true. So how does, the word, how, would, how does the word of God sanctify us? So Mike's quoting out of Titus chapter 3. What would you say if it's verse 5? Five, five, that it's through Christ and him alone that this righteousness comes. That's why it's so important for us uh, to understand that, um, that, that it's his righteousness that is given to us or imputed to us. And then our sins are given to him. And that Jesus came to die for uh, the sins. This leads us into sec the second point where I've simply said, Jesus, our sin bearer. Jesus is our sin bearer. In First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24... Peter says this, who himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, or the cross that we see right there, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. In that section there in 1 Peter, what is it that we're being healed of or from? He said, by your stripes you have been healed. What do you think Peter's talking about? What, what do we need a healing from? Sin. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty simple. Rick said, from sin. We need to be healed from sin. That, we, that because of we are sinful through and through, like I said in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that we have heaped up for ourselves uh, basically destruction, if you look at the, you know, what the good news is in light of the bad news, and that we see here in 1 Peter chapter 2 that, uh, that, that Jesus bore our sins, that he freely bore our sins, um, as the, as the sin bearer. And so it's important for us to see that as well. Also, we can see the righteousness in there, in that verse that Jesus is uh, referring, to, or that Peter is referring to about Jesus. And also in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, and she, and she will bring forth, talking about Mary, a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's really, if you just sum up the Christmas story, like I said, condense it down into what a couple of words, God with us, and that also that Jesus is the one that's going to save us uh, from our sins. It's an important thing for us uh, to understand. Uh, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 25, uh, Paul says, For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right, or that, that can also be translated righteous. People are made righteous with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So we're made right with the Lord based off of what Jesus has done uh, for us. Uh, the third thing that we're going to look at this morning is Jesus the Word. Jesus the Word. So we've 
kind of looked at Jesus, our righteousness, that we that He is that He has given or He has given to us His righteousness as we take on uh, as He takes on our sins. And then the second point there, Jesus, our sin bearer, that He died for the sin. That's the reason why He came. A few kind of summed up in one little sentence that Jesus came to die for sinners. As a matter of fact, that's what Luke chapter nineteen and verse ten says that He came to seek and to save the lost. And so now, Jesus is the Word. Um, in John chapter 1, Scripture tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Then in verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the, the, the section of scriptures we're talking about, Jesus being the Word, it says that the Word became flesh. Do you ever, I mean, do you ever consider Jesus as being like the Word of God? Do you ever think about that? I mean, if you consider, what is it, Psalm, I think it's like Psalm 138, and verse 2 says that, that He magnifies His Word above His name. What does that mean that I'm, God says, I magnify my Word above my name? Who does he, who's he magnifying? God magnifies his word above his name. Christ. Who said that? Megan? <laughs> so there's like, a, there's like a whisper going on <laughs> through the congregation this morning. Yeah, it's just simply Christ. Um, whenever uh, God says that in Psalm 138, that I magnify my word above my name, he magnifies the very person of Jesus Christ as well as the written word. And so uh, we see here in John chapter 1 uh, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, it was the very word of God. So if you want to, if you're interested in who God is, you know, is there a God out there? Is there someone out there uh, that has spoke or is speaking? Is there a God that's created uh, the things that we see and even some of the invisible things we don't understand and see? You know, is he out there? And, and what basically the Bible teaches us is, is that we look to Christ. You know, if you want to know, if you want to know what God thinks, read the Bible. Look to Christ. What, how does Jesus think? If you want to see how God behaves, how He acts, you look at the person of Jesus Christ. And that's why I think He says that in Psalm 138 is that He magnifies um, him, him, the Word above all of His name. Now, this is just a side note. As I was thinking about this right now, as I was reading it, there in John chapter one, it says, "In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God." Where it says, "And the Word was God." If you put the, an A, the letter A, in front of word right there, so it would read, and the word, and the word was a God. I'm sorry, you put it right, right. What does that do to that verse? What's that? <laughs> Would you, I didn't catch what you said. Oh, blasphemy. But actually, that's probably the nicest way to put that. It blasphemes the word. How does that blaspheme the word if you add an A there? And so this is a side note for you, if you just want to tuck this in the back of your mind. Um, who's ever had any contact with the Jehovah's Witness? You probably get literature, <laughs> knock on the door. If you look at their translation, that's exactly what that translation does. If you've ever read the Bible, uh, in their Bible, is that they, they purposely put an uh, A there because they don't believe that Jesus is God. They don't believe the same way that we would believe. And so... When you, when you get into like of talking and debating with the Jehovah's Witnesses, I would caution people because, to be truthful, they're actually very good with, with what they do. They, they go through special training. It's something they always uh, have gone through uh, to be able to speak to Christians or us. And if we don't study our Bibles and know the truth and know like stuff like that is out there, uh, where they place a letter that just totally changes the whole verse up, um, it, it could be something that can cause us problems if you're trying to debate with them. Um, and they, 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 sometimes what they'll do is they'll stump in you, and it, it causes you, your own faith. You begin to kind of doubt, you know, do I truly know the Lord? Because you can't uh, debate with folks that are like that. But it says there in John chapter 1 that, uh, that Jesus is the Word. What does that mean, that Jesus is the Word? The Word of God.
So Tracy said everything that is in the, basically the written word as we look at the Bible, and most of you guys know whenever you come here on a Sunday morning, that's what we predominantly look at. Actually, I, got, I was listening to a gentleman named Steve Lawson, and he says there's two kind of pastors in the world, those who preach from the Bible and those that need to be fired. I, I was, what's that? What's that? Uh, he said, "There's two." There, I was reading this. I don't know if you know Steve Lawson. He's friends with John MacArthur. But he said, "There's two types of preachers in the world: ones that preach from the Bible, and ones that need fired because <laughs> because they don't preach from the Bible." You know, when I read that, I mean, it's a pretty challenging statement. Whenever, whenever if you consider uh, what uh, Steve Lawson was saying, you know, that's one of the reasons why um, one of the reasons why I just predominantly use the Bible. I mean, my opinion and the things that I think doesn't necessarily matter. I mean, there's going to be times, obviously, I give my opinion, but, I, but, but I, what I should be doing is making sure that it is according to God's Word, that as we see here, Jesus is the Word of God. And what Tracy said is that the reality is, uh, and Jesus said this, that we'll be judged by the Word one day. So what, what, he basically, what, that, what Jesus meant when he said that was simply when the Bible was opened up and all, all the things that are in the Bible is what's going to judge us according to how we've lived our lives. And if we have Jesus as our righteousness, we're going to be found not guilty. But if we haven't accepted Christ, if we haven't um, come to that understanding of who Christ is, that he is our righteousness, that he is our sin bearer, uh, we'll have to take it on ourselves, and it's just something that we can't do. So we see here in, in the third point here, Jesus being the word of God. You know, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about our church and where, we're go like, where are we going from here? What would you say in this past year that there's been, what successes do you, would you say that we've had in this church as we're look, looking at 2021? Actually, I was thinking about what Liz just said. I mean, if you look around the room right here, this is the core group. Everybody in this room, as I look at each person in this room, would, I would consider you a part of the core group, which doesn't make no sense because it would almost would indicate that there's others out there, but there's not. We just have a core group of people. Uh, you know, I remember when I was sharing with Rod, when Rod was going to come up here on the past two Sundays while I was gone on vacation and to share. I mean, I've told Rod before, I've told other people here before, that you're basically speaking to your family. Like, there's... Not really any, you know, we rarely see guests that come in. And like what Liz said, one of the things that we can simply applaud uh, for 2021 is that the core group stays together. What would be something that, uh, that as we're considering Jesus being the Word of God and what the things and the kind of things that we do here um, in the storehouse, what would be something that we should look, look to, look towards in 2022 to put into practice here in the church? Because I've been thinking a lot about this as we're closing out this year and coming into a new year here in about a week and a half or so. What are some things do you think, John? So John was talking about uh, in having a family over at their place. Um, I mean, that's one of the things that I think that we should be really focusing on as we move in um, to 2022, is that we do have a core group of people here. And I think that all of us are pretty tight. Um, I think that the Lord is pleased with what we do. I know that one of the focuses, from my standpoint anyways, uh, that I have put into practice here is to making sure that we're going to be in God's Word. And I, as I was thinking about 2022, that's what I think I'm going, to do. I'm going to be focusing a lot more on when we do like our Sunday evening studies. Um, and some other things that we're going to start going through the Bible. Who here would admit that you need to know the Bible better than you do? All of us, I think we're all in that. I mean, I need to be reading it more. And so as, um, as we go into 2022, I think what I'm going to focus on is on Sunday mornings, we're going to start going through New Testament books and knowing what these books or these letters have to say for us. And then on the evening, Sunday evenings, we're going to go through the Old Testament. And I'm going to be honest with you. That's going to cause me to have to really study, because if I'm honest, I don't know the Old Testament like I should, like, like I don't know the New. Um, the New Testament is basically where I spend a lot, a lot of my reading 
Um, on occasions, I do go to the Old Testament and look at some things, but it's important for us to know Genesis uh, through Revelation. And based off of what we're looking at here, um, this third point, Jesus being the Word, um, he reveals to us things that's in his Word. Um, if you consider like what uh, uh, Paul says, what's it, the Second Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses, I think it's like, like verse 15 through verse 17, uh, it, it says that God's Word basically is breathed out, it's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for rebuke, and for training in righteousness that we might be thoroughly equipped and prepared for every good word. And so if you look at that section in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, basically what Paul is telling us is, is that we should know the Bible. The Bible is the, what gives us the doctrine. What's doc, what, what does the word doctrine mean that is profitable for doctrine? And is, do, and is doctrine important? So we're talking about the word, Jesus being the word. What is doctrine? You hear that word in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine. And so the word doctrine that Paul uses there in 2 Timothy, and really what Mike just said, is a doctrine, simply the word, it can also be said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, or the word that it can be used in there is teaching, is the word teaching. So doctrine just simply means teaching. So when you understand what the Bible is, you understand that it's God's word, it's, for, it's his revelation to us, and we're looking at this section here, this, this third point, uh, that Jesus is the word of God, um, it's so uh, vitally important that we understand, you know, that what, what's God, God's word says to us and the doctrines. And so it tells us everything from, I mean, when you look at the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, it tells us everything uh, about who God is, what his expectation is for us. It tells us the, ba the bad news. I mean, the reality is the bad news is really bad news about how people um, are before the Lord, that they're not right before God, and that God's wrath is on them, and God is going to uh, one day turn them over to, them, to themselves. But then it takes us to the good news, which simply is what we're looking at this morning, this kind of this little bit of a Christmas message, um, that, it, that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And I think Tracy said it really well is when she said that the God that we serve is not a faraway God. He's, he's not foreign. He's there in our lives. Who would say that in 2021 that God was personal in your life? I was thinking of Rick sitting here right in front of us, you know, just some of, some of the struggle he's went through with medical stuff. Um, whenever we have people that go through stuff, and if you're a believer and you have a relationship with the Lord, um, he shows up. I know when Tracy went through her cancer in 2018, God, God gave us a word. So we're looking at what this kind of looks like, Jesus the Word, um, God gave Tracy a word. We know it was Isaiah 41.10. And basically it's a promise that God would be with her during that time period. And God was faithful. And so when you go through difficulties like this, the word of God is something that, that we lean towards and lean on uh, to have comfort and to bring comfort into our lives. And so this, the second point um, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 16 and 17 says, So all, all scripture is profitable for doctrine and rebuke. What does rebuke mean? What's that? Correction. Correction. If you're if you're going to be rebuked, if you ever kind of use that in a sentence, that if we kind of like it, say the Lord rebuked me, what would that what would that look like? Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting. Way John John Olson said, "It's telling you that you're one hundred percent wrong." Who would agree that when you look at the Bible, if you compare it to your life, which, what's actually right or what's correct? The Bible. You know, it always corrects our lives. So that section in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, verses 16 and 17, all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, so it's profitable for teaching, it's profitable for rebuking us, and then it says it's profitable for correction. What's correction? <laughs> You might like Mike said, gets, gets us back on course. So what it does is simply the Bible, it rebukes us in that if I'm living a certain way or I'm thinking a certain thing, 
um, and I come across it in the Bible, if it, it says this is the way you should do it, um, you're doing it wrong. It's not, that's what God's word is that, um, and does for us. It rebukes us. It shows us where we've not, where we're missing the point, where we're not doing what would be pleasing to the Lord. But it just doesn't simply leave us there in, in a state of rebuke. Um, and it says that the correction comes. And the last part of Second Timothy chapter three says that, that it trains us up in righteousness. How would how do you think God's word, as we're talking about Jesus being the word of God, how does God's word train you, train me, train us? up in, into righteousness. Yeah, Kathy says it shows us, it tells us how to live. Who would, have, who would agree that you ran across parts in the Bible that contradict your life? When you look at something and say, good night, I didn't know that. I mean, one of the ones I'll just use as an example, I'll just use myself. I know back probably 20 years ago, 18 to 20 years ago, one of the problems I used to have was a problem with anger. I used, to, I used to be just, I'd get angry. For, I mean, Tracy remembers that it would be, I mean, she's shaking her head back there like she had to live through it. I mean, that just, I'm being honest with you. I had an issue with anger 18, 20 years ago. And I knew that it was wrong. And so what I did was I went into the Bible and I wrote down um, different Bible verses that would uh, uh, talk to me about anger. It would basically rebuke me. And then it showed me the corrective thing uh, that I, um, how, long, how long did it take until I got free from that? Yeah, a while. It took a couple of years. Sometimes it takes a couple of years for God's word to dig things out of your life. But the thing about it is now is like probably for the last 10 years or more, I haven't had an issue with anger. Why, why is that? Yeah, like Tracy just said, God's word changed me. So anytime that I was, if anybody here has ever had a problem with anger, I always say it starts in the lower part of your abdomen. It kind of comes up. If you ever feel that, it comes, it starts to circulate. It starts to move up. It coming, it's getting hot. You can just feel like when you're getting angry. I, I used to feel that way a lot. And obviously, Tracy being married to me, I had to deal with a lot of that crazy stuff that I had to do. Um, but what I would do with the Bible verses is I would simply uh, read the Bible verses, uh, put a lot of them to memory. And when I would start to feel that uh, coming up, I would read the verse and I would start meditating on the verse and the anger would, would subside, it would go away. And you could do that really if you struggle with anything in life. You know, the Bible has something to say. I'm, I'm pretty confident to say that the Bible has something to say for everything that we go through. Absolutely everything, Linda. So Linda was talking about Psalm 23, if you, that section where there, and there where it talks about the rod and the staff, they comfort me. How, does, how do you think Jesus comforts us by using the rod? We, we might understand the staff, because the staff, you know, it's got the hook on it, and it's, they would use that thing to guide the sheep and to put the sheep back into where they're supposed to go. Well, how is it that, that a rod is a, something positive for, for us? So as Mike was just saying, there's, there's time. I don't know if anybody, you know, you think about that, but if you're living in such a way that contradicts the Bible, it contradicts God's word, it contradicts what God would have, how God would have us to live for him, it's actually in Hebrews chapter 12, if you, if you want to write this down, because this is so important. Hebrews chapter 12, five, I think it's like verses 5 through 11, somewhere in there, I think it's 5 through 11, it talks about those that God loves, he rebukes and chastens. Is that, do you think that's a loving thing for God to do? So, Liz, I don't know if anybody's ever dealt with kids. Actually, I was just kind of laughing because uh, when Caleb, Caleb and Abby actually flew out to California to spend the Christmas with her parents, and C Caleb sent us a text and said, what was it? They had a bad kid? 
in the plane. It was like right in front of, I think what Caleb was texting is that there was a kid there that was whining and crying, and he did it for the, almost the whole five-hour flight. Um, so what, what, but what Liz has said, said is, you can, if you look at somebody as being parents and their, and their kids are really bad, it says, it says a lot really about the parents. And, uh, but the reality is, and I'm sure you've heard this before, is who would agree that children actually want discipline? I don't know if you've ever heard that they actually want it. They want, I think what they do is they, they want somebody to care for them. And it, it, if you consider Hebrews chapter 5, uh, the, whom the Lord rebukes, he chastens. He chastens and rebukes. It says that the people that he loves, in the same way that a father rebukes or chastens their children, there's nothing wrong with uh, doing a gentle, having a gentle rebuke in your children's life. But the thing about it is God also uh, does that too in our lives. I've gone through times in my life where I would simply say, I went through a season of God's chastening where he comes in and he brings a chastening hand, but it's a good thing that if you're being chastened, because it, it shows you that you're a son. Like I said, that if you guys know Chuck Swindoll, he said that uh, that word actually means to be skinned alive. That sometimes, who knows that sometimes God has to spank you? He just simply does. And I mean, I don't know how, how that looks. Uh, you'll know if you're going through it. There's actually two things in Hebrews chapter 5, verses, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. Um, there's a couple things in there, actually two things in there, that gives us, or the, it's the reasoning why we go through that. Who knows what those are? If you know the section, it mean, it's, it's to produce holiness and to be partakers of his righteousness. To be for holiness and to be partakers of his righteousness. He said that's what the reason he does in Hebrews chapter 12 is that he disciplines people that he loves as their children. And it's mainly because uh, he's trying to produce a holiness and a righteousness in our lives. And we can see here as we've been talking this morning about the very first thing, that this truth about Jesus, our righteousness, what it should do is cause us to get, uh, grow into a deeper relationship and, uh, with him so that his righteousness is seen more clearly in our lives. Let's move on now for the, the fourth point. Jesus is God in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. There's a place in John chapter 14. This is a pretty popular, actually verse 6 um, is, is probably one of the most popular parts of John 14. But uh, there's a section here in John chapter 14 um, that Jesus says this. He said, if you have known me, uh, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And it says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Uh, so how can you say, show us the Father? What did Jesus say in that? What did he just say? He, Megan said it perfectly, I am God. So when you have these, these times, that you, if you ever come across a debate with the Jehovah's Witness, that's one of the things that they're going to, um, they're going to, they're going to move, try to move you away from you actually thinking uh, that Jesus is God. And we saw in that section there in John chapter 14, um, actually one of the, it's not on the screen, but one of the uh, pretty famous verses in there is John 14 verse 6, where it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father but by me. It's just a verse above what we looked at. But what we can see here as Jesus is having this discussion uh, with Philip, and he basically tells Philip, listen, if you want to know who God is, if you want to know who he, what he thinks, if you want to know um, how he, he behaves, how he acts, or what expectation that God has, you simply look at Christ. Um, I'm going to read a section that's going to be pretty long this morning in Colossians chapter 1. It's verses 13 through 22. And it's just to really reinforce that Jesus is God, that he is God in flesh. In Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 13, it says this, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of, of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So this, these section of verses are going to have a lot of stuff in them, that's, a lot of truth that's packed in these verses. Verse 15 says, He is the image of of the invisible God. So it says that Jesus Christ is the image of, of the invisible God, or God in flesh, the firstborn over all creation. It says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And, for, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, as Christ is the head of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. So if you want to know who God is, the fullness of an, of an infinite God, you look at Christ, and that's basically what he says there in verse 19. And then it continues in verse 20 and says, And by him uh, to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his, of his cross, and you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach, in his sight. So I know there's a lot that I just read there. Because as I, actually, I was, only, I was really looking at verse 15 and verse 19. And I was going to kind of just going to chop them out of that and just talk about this. But I think the whole thing is, is so important. Matter of fact, if you keep going on past Colossians chapter 1 and verse 22, there's a lot more in there. But I just kind of, for time's sake and for my notes this morning, I just condensed it down into those verses 13 through 22. What did we hear in that verse, in those section of verses? If you can remember something. So Mike says that the Jesus is the creator God. I mean, we see there in that section where it talks about the things that were made. That's the things that are visible and invisible. Jesus made them and he made them for himself. Um, and, it's, and he says that he is the head of the church. But what he says there in verse 15 is that he is the image of the invisible God. So if you want to know who God is, if you want to see who God is, or you want to know what he thinks, you look to what Christ had to say. You look to what Christ thinks. Because it says there in verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. So all of what God is going to reveal to us has been displayed in the person of Jesus Christ. And so it's important for us to understand that Jesus is God in the flesh. And so if you ever have those times when you are going to be in a debate with anybody, it doesn't matter if it's Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons or uh, different people, uh, there's a lot of people out there, Christian science does the same thing. I don't, I don't want to just pick on the Jehovah's Witness or the Mormons, but they all have a different what about Jesus. What is it that they teach about Jesus? Do you guys know? Different doctrine about who Christ is. Some say that he is actually an angel. Some say that he wasn't God. And so for me, like, you know, I don't get into all the debates with, uh, and I think I shared this with you one time about the Jehovah's Witnesses. I know what their Bible does in John chapter 1, where it inserts the little, that little word A in front of God, a God, that Jesus is one among many gods and that we also could become gods. I remember one time I had a, um, I think it was me and Trace was sitting over there when we lived on the Williamsport Pike, and we got a knock, knock at the door, and I looked out the little oval window, and I remember thinking first, like, ah. I don't really want to do this. I don't want to go out because I know, I mean, I saw him and I, I could have simply not answered the door, but I decided to answer the door and I went out. And we sat out in the driveway and talking about the things about who Christ was. And I can remember just sharing with him simply, you guys don't have anything to give me. I, I am at perfect peace with my relationship with the Lord. And, you know, and, and I, they, they were trying to get me or entice me into a debate or an argument with them, but I just never went there. And so basically it foiled whatever plan they had um, for me or how, whatever they wanted to do to me, trying to get me converted from being a Jehovah's Witness into being, uh, or from being a Christian into being a Jehovah's Witness. And the last point that we're going to look at this morning is, is point number five, or the five truths about Jesus. And this is the one, and we're, remember we're talking about out of Isaiah 7 and Matthew chapter 1, uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy uh, that uh, his name was going to be Emmanuel, which is simply God uh, with us. Uh, talking about his birth, talking about almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus coming into existence, coming into uh, being, uh, basically uh, to become the word of God, to become our righteousness, the things that we've been talking about. And the last thing that this morning uh, I want to look at is point number five, that Jesus, I just simply said, coming again. Who knows Christ is coming again? Who believes that Christ, Christ's second coming is closer than 
There was a couple of hands going up. I, I am convinced that we're, live, we're obviously living much closer to his second coming than his first coming. His first coming was almost 2,000 years ago. But his second coming, I believe we're right at the doorstep. Um, Tanner, actually, I think, he sent me something to read this past week or so when I was in Illinois about some of the, the players that are uh, beginning to take place in... Um, in, in Israel, around Israel, some of the big players that in the end time prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, as well as uh, Ezekiel chapter 37, but specifically verses 38 and 39, God tells us in the same way that he told us here in Isaiah 7 who to look for is simply this Emmanuel God with us being the fulfillment of Christ, that there are things taking place right now in the Middle East that is a fulfillment to Bible prophecy. And those things, and, and Bible prophecy experts are kind of I don't say that they're, they're contradicting one another, but some, some of them think that the rapture of the church is going to take place before this attempted invasion of Israel. And you look at some of these practical things that we talk about like that, it's simply all pointing to Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And that's what I want to read this morning in John chapter 14. As I was considering, so I was looking at Acts chapter 1 and some other places uh, to, to have a verse up here that can just talk about Jesus' second coming, I wanted to, to basically look at this verse here in John chapter 14 because it speaks comfort to me. But in John chapter 14, starting in verse 1, it says this, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be, and where I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how, you, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, and this is this pretty popular verse in the Bible, John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also, and from now on you know him and have seen him. So J Jesus is just reiterating what we already talked about of him being in the flesh, that Jesus is God. And then the other truth that we saw in here is that uh, Jesus said that he's going away to prepare a place and that he's going to come back one day and take us to himself. And I'm convinced that that day is rapidly approaching, that Jesus is coming back. And so what, what are some of the practical things that we can uh, talk about out of John uh, chapter 14 that Jesus is coming back? It's just simply this. You, you hear a lot of folks talking about the second coming, and when, when there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people out there that don't understand his first coming. It's important for us to share, you know, this time of year, maybe we're going to have opportunities uh, this Thursday when we go caroling to talk to some folks, to tell them about Jesus coming in flesh, that Jesus uh, is the prophesied uh, Messiah that we're, we're seeing here in um, Isaiah chapter 7, that we can share Christ with other people. And, and this is a great time of the year to do that, um, is to share Christ with people, to talk about his first coming, to talk about uh, why he came and why it's important that they understand who Jesus is because one day they're going to go and meet him. So with that being said, let's close this morning. Has anybody got any thoughts? Anything to add? Mm -hmm. I think what Kim says is also with, based off of what, or some of what Tracy said as well, is that basically what I just heard from Kim was that she is so appreciative that God is with us, that, that, that you can have a relationship um, with him. And I mean, if you think about that, and um, all you simply have to do is, and like I said, this coming year, I would really like for our church to be a church that gets into the Bible, that we start digging through some truths in the Bible, that we memorize it, that we put it into practice. And like what Kim was saying, is that God is right there. He's just simply a... A page, a page is being opened, 
page being turned, a page being read and thought about and meditated on. And so that's why it's vitally important for us to know the Bible, because it's the revelation that God has given us to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's so key. Anybody else got anything else to add this morning? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father.